Hello, this is a replacement for a recent live recording where unfortunately the soundtrack wasn't all it could be. Um, so here we, here we go again. Um, this is the first of a series that I'm doing uh, for authors um, on the whole subject of how to create uh, an audio book. Uh, the reason for doing this is because of what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, audio books have become increasingly more popular. Uh, I think they particularly appeal to people on the go. That's uh, commuters uh, on trains and public transport uh, with their smartphones and uh, tablets and so on uh, who want to listen to a book maybe rather than read one. And of course, a traditional market for audio, which is people uh, driving in their cars or other vehicles and, and wanting to listen to something when obviously they can't read. Anyway, one way or another, the, the sale of audiobooks has gone up enormously and for any author who's already got an ebook or a printed book uh, there's a missed opportunity so that's a very good reason for wanting to produce an audio book and that that's why we've got this session today uh, this is an introductory session so I'm not going to get into detailed technical aspects there will be other pieces to help you with that uh, but the first thing to do really is to set the scene and line up all the basics that you need in order to make such a recording so if you uh, look to uh, the right of the screen you'll see a brief summary of what's in today's session um, getting set up preparing and planning and so on you can you can see that for yourself uh, there won't be much chance in this actual recording for questions and answer but so what I invite you to do is to email me or comment on the video and I will certainly be following it up and your feedback will certainly help uh, influence uh, the what I do in future sessions and the priority with which I cover things so um, if you if you just briefly look at behind me on the screen you'll see that is um, a page from the endless bookcase audiobook shop we have three of our titles. I know some some of our authors are, are watching this. Um, I would very much like to add you to the list. But even if you're not with the Endless Bookcase as an author, we can probably help uh, either by coming to some, you or us coming to some arrangement with your existing publishers if they don't do audio books, um, or, or just doing the thing completely independently. Um, I'm very happy to work with with other publishers when it comes to audiobooks and, and ebooks for that matter, where people are just doing the conventional printing. So uh, let's let's move on a bit um, and uh, see uh, what else we're covering. Um, I've already alluded to this, but the re the basic reason why you'd want to have an audiobook is you'll sell more books. And the ironic thing is, it isn't just that pe people will be buying your audiobook because it's now available. There's this funny effect where if you have an audio book as well as an ebook and a paper book, the overall sales increase. And some people certainly buy all editions, and some people buy an audio book and a paper book. So it really does help your sales. But the, the big challenge for anyone who wants an audio book is, is to do with cost. Uh, it is inherently expensive to produce an audio book because of all the time that it takes to do the recording. And even if you record very well, there's always editing involved. And those two time-consuming activities add cost. So what I'm trying to do here is show you how you can tackle certainly the recording side of it yourself and maybe the editing. And in that way, you will reduce the cost right down and make it viable to produce your audio book. And it isn't that difficult to do. Uh, obviously, you have to learn a few things. And you don't have to compromise on quality. And the the tool that I would recommend, and the only one I'm actually going to bother to talk about, is Audacity. Now, Audacity is this one, one of these wonderful pieces of software, which is in, made entirely through a team of volunteers, really high quality volunteers producing this software. It's been around many years. It is a standard. It's very widely used. It's used for all kinds of audio recording, um, certainly uh, music is heavily recorded there and other things, um, but it, it's it's well up to the job when you want to produce uh, an audio book. And although Audacity is a very powerful piece of software with all sorts of amazing features and facilities and functions, it is actually extremely easy to use, more or less 
straight out of being installed. There are a few specific things you need to get the hang of and I'll, I'll touch on those today and certainly cover them in some other sessions. Um, so uh, I'm saying to go to Audacity, there's a link on the screen, but if you just Google Audacity, you will find it. Um, but if we just have a quick um, look at look at Audacity, um, here we are. Uh, this is what you see when you start Audacity. Or you'll see something very similar. There are different versions running on different operating systems, PC, uh, Mac, and so on. But but it and different versions of Audacity look slightly different. But they all look basically the same. So so and as with a lot of things, when you first look, it is a bit daunting. But it but you can ignore lots of what's there. And I'll draw your attention to the top of the screen here where you have what is a very familiar kind of set of controls on just about all audio and some video devices where you've got a red uh, record button, a stop button, the squared stop button and a pause button at the left and, and a forward and back, uh, these two arrows with a bar on them and then there's the green for when you want to play back uh, and most of the time that's all you actually need to, to use um, but there are a few other things of course um, if you stay at the top there, you'll see there's a little microphone sign there. And if you click on that, then you see what sort of signal level. And you do need to adjust the signal level when you're recording. And and that's um, done, done lower down. And uh, you can also look at playback. Now, there are one or two things uh, when you're using it to make sure that you select the right inputs. And if we look down here below that other piece, um, you do need to make sure that you're you're selecting uh, the microphone that you're actually speaking to, otherwise you won't see a recording. As soon as you sit, hit record, this big grey area here suddenly becomes a stereo uh, representation of the two channels, uh, you know, the typical waveform you get with sound. And by looking at that, you can immediately get a visual check that the sound is um, at the right sort of level, and not distorted. And, um, and off you go. And then once you've done your recording, you can um, easily go back and edit. Um, that's about all I'm going to cover at the moment, looking at the Audacity screen, because I'd like to go back and cover some, um, if you like, non more non-technical points about it. And uh, if we can just uh, move on from Audacity then. Um, a key thing is uh, preparation and planning. And um, the, the first thing, um, when you're doing recordings is to get yourself a decent headset um, with um, a decent microphone and, and and there's a picture of the sort of thing on on the screen now it doesn't have to be expensive you can buy a perfectly adequate headset for a little more than 10 pounds or between 10 and 20 pounds typically you know there's 15 to 25 dollars if you're working in dollars um, and, in, and indeed, there really isn't very much to be gained by spending a lot more money. Um, not for sound. If you were into music, then that, that might be a bigger issue. And uh, it does help to just check a few of the features when you buy one of these. Um, certainly, a lot of these headsets have features to, to cut out extraneous noise. Um, so it, it just picks up your voice. And that's that's well worth um, checking. But But most of the ones on readily available um, are going to do the do the job just just fine and then you need to adjust the the mouthpiece so it's it's right so just picking up a few more things um, there's a few there's a few points I've listed here that, that you really do need to think about um, one is I would say um, you want you want to have the um, if you're reading the book, you want it somewhere where you're not going to make extra noise that's going to be picked up the microphone, having a cloth on the table, sometimes printing the book out off instead of using the actual book itself, um, sometimes ad ad making adjustments just to make it easier for you to read. Um, and uh, in a conventional book, there's usually quite a lot at the front, isn't there? There's the title page, there's the um, uh, the, 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 the table of contents, there's often a preface, there's a bit about the author. For an audiobook, I'd say, if you want to include some of that information, do it right at the end. But really, all you want is a very brief title, um, you know, the equivalent of the title page, you know, the title of the book, who it's by, what it's about. And the, and the other stuff that goes in there 
is best replaced by a very small piece which is just an introductory um, piece on you know what what the book's about and who it's for uh, just to get the reader in there as quickly as possible and then go straight into the first chapter um, pictures and diagrams uh, if you've got pictures and diagrams in your book obviously people can't see those if you're doing an audio book so you need to give thought in advance to how you're going to handle those and um, often that you can just dispense with them but you may need to change you know the way the the text goes and I'll, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes and, and some strategies for for dealing with diagrams if you really do need to make use of it in some way doing the the uh, recording and then before you do anything with the technical equipment then do do practice reading out loud a lot of people who read very well don't read out loud very often uh, sometimes they do more if they've got children but um, so a bit, a bit of practice at reading out loud uh, really is a good idea and uh, j just before you've done any recording um, so uh, let's just quickly look at differences between audiobooks and paper books I've touched on some of this already obviously you don't have this long piece at the beginning typically um, just a one piece to set the scene as I've already said you can put extra content at the end um, so it, it's already a bit different from what you would expect with um, excuse me uh, what you'd expect um, with um, a paper book and uh, let's just talk about this issue of uh, diagrams in a little bit more detail uh, often uh, you can address the issue of a diagram that you want to describe to the reader by just helping them use their imagination and the best way to do that that I know of is you actually say imagine so imagine that you're looking at a house say uh, you, you, you suggest to the reader what they're imagining they're looking at and then you describe what they're looking at and the, they will form a picture in their own head you can highlight features you want them to think about and from there you can then start to uh, talk them through what you want to talk about obviously you don't want to make things too complicated so if there's quite a lot in your diagram you probably need to start thinking in terms of painting multiple pictures or going back and saying a bit more but that that whole imagine um, approach really does work another question I get asked about a lot is dialogue uh, sometimes within a text even in fiction and so on there is dialogue between people and there's a tendency to think oh well we need multiple people reading this multiple narrators as it's called normally that's a mistake it's very difficult to do to marshal all the individuals to do it and there's you're running into technical problems most people reading most narrators I'm sure you can do this can vary their voice to reflect different uh, voices uh, that are speaking say in a dialogue one of the easiest ways to do that is just to raise the tone of your voice so one person speaks up there somewhere but don't make it sound like Mickey Mouse with a falsetto but you can just vary the tone of your voice a bit just to highlight the different characters um, if you're more confident and you have a clear idea in your head about the characters you may you can certainly vary it more but you don't have to vary it that much to, to do the trick and, um, and I'd say don't overdo it now another question is about sound and music. I'm, I'm not really going to say very much about that today because it's a huge subject and it, this is too much for one session. But sound and music do help a lot uh, when you're producing an audio uh, piece. Uh, even if you keep it down to something as simple as just having a little bit of sound and music playing at the beginning and or at the end. Sometimes people like to play music as a background got to be very careful you don't make it too loud and make it harder to listen <laughs> even the big TV companies seem to make a, a silly mistake of that uh, it's so easy to do um, and uh, when it comes to sounds occasionally it can help to have a sound I think when doing audio recordings for children um, then and you want to illustrate what you're saying more uh, having having sounds means if you're talking about animals you could have animal sounds that works well but for most purposes uh, often there isn't any need for any sound at all um, but the one big thing here and you do need to be so careful about this is if you are introducing sounds for goodness sake make sure you have proper copyright and royalty free sounds um, are not always totally royalty free 
for all purposes. So you need something that's royalty free when using it to record an audio book. And do check that. Otherwise, after the event, you could have somebody chasing after you with a, a large invoice that uh, could come as a nasty surprise. So um, now, now the next thing I'd like to briefly cover is another huge topic, which is how to read for recording. Um, so stating the obvious, um, and it's, it's easier said than done, try to be somewhere where there isn't any background noise. Um, there often is some slight background noise, um, but you know, phones phone start to ring, the heavy vehicles go past, planes fly over, and all the rest of it. It can really spoil it. Uh, it can add a bit of colour, of course, if it's just a faint noise in the background. But uh, if it's interfering with somebody being able to listen, that really, that really doesn't help, does it? Um, the having I mentioned this already, if you have a nice cloth on a table, if you're sitting at a table, the table does help because you can then have the book in front of you. That will absorb any accidental knocks and sounds and work very well in that respect. Um, so I would normally do that. Um, take your time. Generally speaking, uh, people who are reading an audio book, including their own book, will, will, will read too fast out loud. Um, there's, a, there's a sense of hurrying that just isn't needed. So take your time. Uh, adopt a, a steady pace. Don't, um, don't rush it. Try to speak as clearly as you possibly can. And uh, if, if you have a tendency to go too fast, then you can try to make yourself pause between your paragraphs. You can silently in your head sort of count a couple of seconds, like one and two before you go on. That really does help. It gives the, re the reader or the, really the listener a chance to keep up with you. It's familiar to you. It's not to them. They need time. And it really does make a difference. Uh, avoid puffing into the microphone, get the microphone in the right place, do a few tests. Uh, there is a tendency to puff. Um, if you, you want the mi microphone uh, here somewhere, not there. And um, you know, make sure you've got it in a place where it certainly picks up your voice, but you don't get that noise from the breathing, especially that puffing sound, which is very, very common. Um, so do some tests there. One, one trick I learned years ago is if you light a candle and speak in front of it so you don't make the flame f flame f flicker uh, that that's that's pretty useful and it's easier said than done uh, but it's good practice so that's another thing you might try um, try to record each chapter in a whole session the reason for this is principally that it's amazing how the human voice changes even from hour to hour and certainly from day to day so if you have a break in the middle the the reader the listener will hear a difference if there's any length of time between the sessions. Uh, whereas you go from chapter to chapter, it probably doesn't matter so much. So try to do one chapter in one session. That doesn't mean in one take, you might well have more than one take within the chapter, especially the errors and things, but, but don't spread it out over a long period of time. Um, one chapter at a time is a good thing to do in one session. Um, if you do make a mistake when recording, and everybody does, even the pros, then if it's a short piece you're recording, it's probably best just to stop and completely start again. But on a long chapter, if it's all gone quite well most of the way through, you probably don't want to do that. And so the, the trick is to, if you make a mistake, pause, say something like cut, stop, or something that you'll definitely be able to identify, pause again, and then go back and resume at the point that, where you start the chapter, the sorry, the paragraph where you made a mistake. So you go back to the beginning of the previous paragraph. Don't try and do anything clever like start in the middle of a paragraph. It's just so hard and difficult to edit. So you're leaving these pauses means that the editing job is going to be easier later. And um, you, you, do, you do the pause and, and you carry on. One thing I didn't mention earlier, but I'll mention now about using Audacity. Audacity has a slightly odd uh, terminology to my mind where it, it talks about projects and a, you might think a project would be a book or something but typically a project will relate to a chapter so if you're recording a chapter in a book make that you know uh, project one and, and and then chapter two uh, project two so let, let's move on again and um, the, ne the next thing here 
references and pictures. Picking up from some stuff I mentioned earlier, um, we, we've talked about pictures, but um, in terms of how you might describe them, but so there's some other points here as well. First, first references. If you do want to give references and things with any kind of academic integrity tend to need it, uh, and it's nice to substantiate the claims that you're making. So if you do want to give references, like if, um, and it also gives credibility. So if you want to mention books that you've referred to or have used in your research or whatever it happens to be, or you think would be useful to the reader. Um, those references you can you can give them audibly, but sometimes it's easier if you put them on a web page somewhere, which is accessible to the reader, where they can get the details and more easily download. And the same would be true of in illustrations and links. So though you might not include illustrations, uh, even a mention of illustration in in your audio chapter, you might say that if you go to the web page uh, for this book, uh, you can see um, the image or you can see a link to it. So you don't have to try and fit absolutely everything in the recording. You can have this supplementary information. It's very common. The, the, the page that you're referring to can be one that's uh, private in the sense that only somebody uh, with the, the cover, the details of your audio book or, or, your, or who you're listening to it will know where to go, but it will make a big difference if you can do that. Um, edits and files. Again, I touched on this a minute ago. Um, when you're using Audacity, um, and um, um, it's important to repeat this. I would treat each chapter as a single project and do save the project when you've finished because you can go back and edit it again. Use sensible names like chapter 01, chapter 02. And the reason for doing the 0102 is when you get to uh, 10, um, the, the file names will be in the right order. Um, so 0102, and you probably won't go up to 99, or maybe you will, I don't know. Um, and that later on, when you convert from chapters to tracks, then you can use a similar convention. Um, do keep the original recording. I would tend to copy the original and then edit the copy, uh, because if something goes horribly wrong, it's so awful when you have to go back and re-record everything. So I always work on a copy, I'd say. Uh, you can, once you've finished... Uh, editing a chapter in Audacity, then export it. And there are a couple of way, uh, file formats that are very popular and well worth using. One is WAV, W-A-V, and uh, that's probably got a slightly better quality. And if you're sending them to us for us to edit, uh, we're very happy to have WAV files. The, the other standard is MP4, MP3, MP4, uh, those file formats. And uh, they they again are well worth recording because um, they're, they're, they're widely adopted, easy to edit, and so on. There, there's lots of other file formats, some especially for books, but I'd stay clear of them because um, you get all sorts of compatibility and transfer problems. Audacity is fine, it will output very good quality from your project. And, and do keep backup copies of everything, um, have some kind of backup system, you know, even if it's just a simple thing like another USB drive. Because when you put all that effort in, if you end up losing a chapter or even the whole book, it's so uh, soul destroying. So, you know, keep it backed up and keep copies. Right. Um, sound is something I mentioned before. Just a plea again, whatever you do, don't breach copyright and do check the details. You know, nobody likes reading this fine print of terms and conditions, but you really do need to check that you have got copyright. Uh, some of these royalty-free things turn out not to be under certain circumstances. Um, but, but having said that, if you, if you search the internet, you will find lots of royalty-free sounds, and sometimes it's best to, or music, and it's best to search on royalty-free, um, do a search on the particular kind of thing you're after, rather than um, some general thing. So royalty-free you know, Latin American music or something would, will take you to where you'll get that. So think about exactly what you want. Um, so uh, that's that's that. And uh, now I've got to the end, and this is where I'd normally, in a live one, do a question and answer, which of course it can't do uh, because this is being recorded. But I would invite you to post your questions on this particular piece. And by all means, email me. You'll, 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 you can see how to contact me again on, on the recording. And uh, I'm very interested in requests 
and your priorities for what I do next. I intend to roll out a number of these uh, sessions on recording how to record an audio book, um, some of them in dealing with specific issues. Uh, I'd like to know what your questions are. And uh, uh, on small, small, easy ones, I'll, I'll try to include them within the YouTube uh, list, but uh, provided other stuff as well. So that's it. That's the end of this uh, initial uh, recording on how to produce an audio book. I've tried to keep it high level and simple and straightforward so that any author is happy to have a go at it. If there's anything you feel I've glossed over or isn't clear enough or you'd like more detail about, just let me know and I'll attempt to cover it in a follow-up. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.